genetically modified crops are the answer to global hunger, don't you think? They have a high yield, they are disease resistant, and they are packed with nutrition. I don't agree. GM crops are just a way for corporate monopolies to make a profit from poor farmers. They contaminate non-GM crops, and they spark diseases we know nothing about. Genetic engineering is threatening nature as we know it. You're such a technophobe, aren't you? Technology is the path to our future. Take nanotechnology, for example, the science of particles that are minuscule, but with precise architectures that can't be seen through optical microscopes. They're revolutionizing healthcare. They're magically cleaning drinking water. They're adding strength to life and materials. They are a leap into a dark unknown where human nature boundaries and blood-brain barriers are being breached. They lead us into a world where nanomaterials that we can't even see and new organisms are going to run riot. The tensions are clear. On the one hand, we have utopic visions of a better quality of life, work, and food. And on the other, we have dystopic nightmares of an ethical, social, and environmental breakdown. Hey, we are meant to be arguing. Aren't we getting closer? Well, we are physically, but maybe even in our ideas, we are not that far apart. You are an optimist, and I tend to be more cautious. So are new technologies taking us into a dream world of designer babies, artificial organs, and human-computer relationships? Or are they taking the human out of what constitutes humanity? The reality may not be so black or white, but particular shades of gray. Definitely more than 50 shades of gray, I can tell you. <laughs> the, the more we talk, the more we can see that there is a place for some new technologies, perhaps to combat diseases, or to overcome extreme hardship, or even to access resources that are necessary for survival. But we might both draw the line at using technologies that are aimed at human enhancement, things that may breach the boundaries around what we understand to be human. Just because we have access to technology doesn't mean that we need to use it. So how do we get out of this world of blacks and whites? Well, one of the things we suggest is that we try and break down the perceived boundaries between the heart and the mind, between art and science, between us and them, and between good and evil. And one way to break down these boundaries is by letting ideas clash. The force of such a clash can pull down the walls of separation and open up a common vista of shared values and ideas. We don't always have to agree with one another, but when we step out of our familiar frames of reference, we can begin to see how we can work together. But wait a minute, who are we? And why should you even listen to us? I'm Devashish Munshi. I'm a professor of management communication at the University of Waikato. I call myself an accidental academic. And that's because I used to be a journalist before I stumbled upon the world of academia. Now, journalists and academics often perceive each other to be very different. For example, most academics think journalists are breathless, superficial beings out to do a story without much depth in it. Now, that's not entirely true. Breathless, maybe, but not necessarily superficial. On the other hand, most journalists think that academics live in ivory towers, they work on esoteric stories, they write articles that are read by two and a half people. Uh, <laughs> but that, too, is not entirely true. Academics do have the ear to the ground, and they do work on projects that impact on society. Now, that itself is a lesson in breaking down perceived boundaries. And I am Priya Kurian, a professor of political science and public policy, also here at the University of Waikato. I have been frustrated by adversarial politics, with politicians lined up on either end of contentious issues, which have resulted in stunted policies, not the well-rounded policies we need for the well-being of society. It is this which led me to research in the areas of public policy and political science, particularly environmental politics, feminist studies, and sustainability studies more broadly. 
neither Devashish nor I is a scientist, maybe because we are not scientists, but we have always been fascinated by the politics and culture of science and the incredible potential of science to foster a sustainable society. But we know that if we have to harness that potential of science, what we really need is the ability of the public, the general public, to connect to contentious issues in science and technology and participate in decision making around them. As you can see, we come from two very different disciplines. We argue passionately on our positions. One of us tends to be a universalist and the other a relativist. And in the end, we are we tend to see the other's point of view, and we are always the better off for it, because we both share a common ideal, to pursue diversity in creating a sustainable world. Why are we so afraid of conflict? Why do we have this urge to manage diversity? After all, isn't it the diversity of views and opinions that build the platform for democratizing society? Yet, even in a democracy where we believe in principle, that we ought to be inclusive of diverse viewpoints, the reality is that for most of us, we can't bear to talk to people who think in fundamentally different ways from us. This is a dilemma that confronts us all. How do we foster and find a common ground to allow the crafting of policies which are socially and politically acceptable? It's not that a common ground exists from the very beginning. It's the act of talking, the clash of ideas, that sparks new ideas. We begin to see what might be common between us. Let's take the example of medical nanorobots, for example. These are very tiny artificial devices that are injected into blood vessels. They can find their way, detect, identify, and destroy tumors that are hard to reach in a terminally ill patient. But what if these medical nanorobots slip out of control? What if they annihilate a perfectly functioning organ in a healthy human being? Now, this is a classic clash between an optimist and a pessimist. And it is out of this clash that emerges the idea of responsible healthcare, the idea of what kinds of technologies to use in what context. So what we are trying to build is a platform of active citizenship that addresses inequalities and injustice is not about consensus, but is more about arriving at a set of common shared values that emerge from a clash of ideas, and it is about the democratic redesign of institutions to allow public participation on critical issues facing society. We call this sustainable citizenship. Now, when a friend heard that we were giving this talk, she wrote to us and she said, I don't get this theory. Just tell me what I need to do to be a sustainable citizen. That comment from our friend made us think about how it is that we can communicate this idea of sustainable citizenship. Well, let me tell you, we are not going to be giving you a checklist of what it is to be a sustainable citizen. And we can't do the equivalent of printing out a kidney. We certainly are not advocating that we can create a sustainable world on the basis of an exclusively individual responsibility. We need to think bigger, deeper, and broader if we want real change. And one way of doing that is by connecting disparate, even mismatched dots together form a complex pattern of collective responsibility. To test our idea of sustainable citizenship, we embarked on a project on transforming public engagement on new and emerging technologies. We met scientists, we met social scientists, we met policy planners, we met environmental activists, we met people from everyday walks of life. And we were confronted with a diverse range of views, a taste of which you had at the beginning of our talk. The challenge for us was how we could connect these diverse range of views and find something common to them. It was a big challenge, but guess what? We did it. Public officials, policy planners, and researchers have, in recent years, been focusing on dialogues between those that are deemed to be key stakeholders. 
such di dialogues involving a vast array of different groups of people in society sound really good in theory, but are less effective in practice because invariably in such settings, minority voices tend to get drowned out. So we tried something else, and that something else had two parts to it. In the first part, we adapted and refined a research technique called Q methodology. One of the first things we did was that we compiled a list of statements that encapsulated the views of all the people we met. Now, unlike in regular surveys, where people can agree or disagree with as many statements as they like, in Q surveys, we get them to prioritize. Let's take a look at a simplified version of what we did. Now, in this, you can see two people, red and blue, looking at the statements and expressing their views. They seem to have completely different views on it. And as you can see, they're bunched up on the agree and disagree ends of the scale. Now, in Q methodology, we ask them to prioritize. What we tell them is that, look, you have this many slots, and you have to put one statement on each of those slots. A lot of people were really upset by that. How can you ask us to do that? We agree with so many of those statements. How can we disagree with some of them? Well, that's what you have to do. OK, so then what happened? Now, when, when they were forced to prioritize their statements, that's when we got to see what are the things that are really most important to them and what are the things that they might be willing to work together with. And that's what gave us the platform for a common ground and allowed us to map a way forward. The second thing that we tried was to use deliberative citizen panels. We wanted to see whether in the New Zealand context, what traditionally marginalized groups, such as Maori and youth, young people between the ages of 18 and 24, um, would say if they were asked to engage with thinking about decisions on nanotechnology. And what we created were panels which allowed people to learn about the issue, to ask questions of experts, and then engage in deep discussion. What we learned from these panelists was fascinating. One story in particular struck us as deeply insightful. When the Maori panel was reflecting on what it might mean to have their traditional wood carvings done on materials that may have been enhanced by nanotechnology, um, they realized there were some potential consequences. One was that these carvings could last for a long time which was an exciting possibility. But as they thought more about it, they realized that other things also are possible. If their sacred carving lasts for a long time, lasts forever, then what might it do to the tradition of passing on of knowledge of one, from one generation to the next? Would the younger generation want to, or even need to, learn the skills of carving if carvings last forever. What the panel realized was that in the case of new technologies, there are consequences that are often completely unanticipated. Now let's take the case of the youth panels. Many of these young people were amazed by the fact that we even wanted to hear them because they felt disenfranchised from the policymaking processes. When we talked to them, what was interesting is that they were not interested as much in the pros and cons of new technology, but of everyday realities of employment and survival. And they had divergent views among them too. They, had, they asked good questions. You know, what are these technologies for? Who benefits from these technologies? Now, one of the things that was particularly striking was that they wanted a stake in the future that they were to inherit. And these long meetings, verbose documents, are not quite the way to attract their attention. What was also critical about the panels that we used was the idea of a single demographic panel. Um, if you think about the average, the common public consultation meetings with these diverse groups of people, what we often get, like it or not, are that the dominant agendas 
tends to prevail um, consciously or otherwise. In the case of our Maori panel, facilitated by a Maori leader, what we got were the sharing of ideas, stories, and insights that would never have emerged in your average traditional public consultations. So what did we learn from the Maori and youth panels? The first thing we learned is that not all Maori and not all young people are the same. There are lots of diversities within those. Now, despite those differences, there are some unique perspectives that resonated with each of those groups. And each of those perspectives, in turn, were different from the generic public views on issues. If we were to take something out of those two panels, the two core values that came out of it were equity and diversity. Sustainable citizenship thus is about collective action for an inclusive society. It is less about arriving at a consensus on an easily applicable framework than it is about acknowledging diverse viewpoints and engaging productively with them. Collective action becomes possible when we can allow for a clash of ideas between these diverse perspectives. In order to allow such a clash of ideas, we need to create spaces and processes and institutions that allow for diverse expressions through talk, through art, music, dance, and other forms of media in ways that address the power differentials in society, whether it's based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, or other forms of difference. The future of public engagement, therefore, involves allowing emotionality to wrestle with rationality. It involves finding spaces between the universal and the particular, between the public and the private, and between rights and responsibilities. We envision a future where a physicist engages with psychology, a, a biologist with art, a technocrat with environmental activism. We believe that the language of communication will change when people get out of the jargon of one field and reach out to another. So if there's one thing that we would like to leave you with, it is this idea that it is OK to disagree. We need to embrace disagreements. If we have a genuine commitment to working, not just with different kinds of people, but with different ideas and ideologies and different ways of doing things, then that is one pathway to creating a sustainable world.